Refining and improving culture is a goal that every engineering firm should have, and doing so pays off in many ways throughout the project life cycle. I am your host, Brian Wagner, a licensed professional engineer, and in this episode of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast, I'll be talking with Brian Martz, a department manager at Mays Terracon, about the keys to developing an exceptional quality culture within your organization. So let's jump right in. So now I'd like to welcome to the podcast our guest for today, Brian March from Mays Terracon. Brian, welcome to the Engineering Quality Control Podcast. Thanks, Brian. Um, just to get started, can you just tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe what you do on a daily basis, and a little bit about your legacy and your history? Sure. Um, I am, like you said, I'm Brian March, uh, living in Washington State right now. I work as a civil engineer at Mays Terracon uh, Testing. Um, I, uh, I'm originally from San Diego and, uh, you know, went in the army and I uh, call Louisville, Kentucky, my home. So after I was in the army, I, I ended up, uh, doing a little bit of construction, mostly as a general laborer and a small equipment operator and kind of liked the construction field a little bit. So uh, when I got out, I decided to, as I was raising kids to go back and get my civil engineering degree at Colorado state. And, you know, I, I started working as a construction engineer while I was there, uh, fell in love with it, got to work on a really cool design build project in Denver, Colorado. And uh, that was great, but I fell in love with the industry. So that ended up taking me to a whole bunch of really interesting places to work on a bunch of different great projects. Um, I ended up uh, getting my professional engineering license about 14 years ago. and that was about the same time I got into quality management. And I realized pretty quickly after doing that, that uh, you can develop a good quality program around um, people and around taking care of your customers and be successful at that. So that's what I do on a daily basis. I take care of uh, our people, make sure that they have the tools and equipment they need. And then um, they end up taking care of our customers and then do some business development and pursue a new work and continue that process. So I think you touched on it a little bit with what you your focus is, but I have in my notes here about quality culture, more than just maybe the engineering documents, but the culture that's based on quality. Sure. Yeah, there's a, a difference between just having a quality program and a quality culture. Um, quality culture is when everybody's invested in the quality program. They know what makes a good quality product. Um, they understand the repercussions of poor quality and they're invested in making sure that the, that the quality of the, of the product is, uh, comes out correctly. Not just kind of a laissez-faire, it'll happen if I work really hard type of thing, but, you know, really invested in that and understand that they, they're a big part of making sure that that the quality of the product comes out correctly and trying to improve on that. So can you just elaborate maybe a little bit on how, why you think engineering and construction firms really need to embrace this? Sure. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of times when um, the, the firms will end up um, just working really hard, you know, trying to get their schedule completed. And then you end up having um you end up having a product that's not as good as it could have been. You're not as profitable as it could have been. And, you know, people are, are, um, they want to be proud of the work that they do. Um, but, you know, so you want to have that just for morale itself, but also um, it makes your risk adverse. It makes your company, you know, uh, more profitable and your, and your customers uh, feel like they're, they're more satisfied. They're taken care of. And so that's why it's important to have that. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, the way. I mean, I, I, just trying to like, to dive into more of the why, because it's so easy as a company to be like, we need to hit this deadline and this deadline and that deadline. And, oh, there's four other deadlines coming up on three different projects. And it becomes that acceleration of it's just about getting the work done and not always the best work possible. And from what you're explaining, what I'm getting out of it is that 
in a company that that invests in the culture around the quality that they're looking at and you're you've seen in your experience that because the individuals agree with that idea and, and uh, that investment in themselves they can produce a higher quality of work on the back end even with yeah. those deadlines even with those the aggressive work schedules that we do have yeah it's easy for everybody to, to cut corners right if you get that that schedule pressure um every, you know the the natural inclination for people is just to say if i work really hard i work a bunch of hours yeah i might have to do a little bit of rework but in the end i end up having um, the project done on time well if you didn't make your budget you had to do a bunch of rework your customer's not happy with the way that the product ended up looking you may not get that next job you may not get that follow-on work and, and like i said it people really want to be proud of what they do so having to redo something that's disheartening for people so if you build a culture around that people are proud to come to work your customers are happy because it looks good it's on time you know it's a uh, you know, it's it's a, a little bit cliche, you know, you only get two of the three things, you know, you know, quality, schedule and budget, but you can really come through in all three of those things um, if you really make a, a good attempt at it. And, you know, people want to be part of something that is exceptional. They don't want to be part of a, a mediocre team. And so, you know, right now is a is a time when it's really difficult to retain people. But if you invested in them and you really make sure that you have a good quality product. People are going to really love coming to work. That alone is, is worth having a quality program for me, but you know, it's, it's pretty important to your customer base and retaining that, you know, it helps you get through economic swings and um, in the end, you're going to be more profitable at it. So, you know, it's worth investing. You can just take my word for it, or you can, um, you can give it a shot because uh, I've, I've worked with several different companies, large and small, and, you know, keeping that, that kind of mentality and that, you know, working towards that it's, it's helped uh, them drive success every time. So we have a wide range of the audience from, from new engineers or even junior staff through corporate and leadership and like that whole pyramid of, of business of engineers. And this question's come up several times to me at different events and conferences and things like that. Like, I really like the ideas that have been shared or the ideas that I may have or that you have with this quality culture, but my company doesn't agree with it or they're not worth investing in it. So maybe what advice would you have, even if it's not for a person that isn't making those decisions at a company level, mm -hmm. but maybe their team or their the people, their coworkers that they're working with, what advice might you have for them in the idea of investing in this concept of investing in your people? Sure. I mean, sometimes uh, I think what really got me um, interested in looking into it the first time was there was a, a couple of trigger events. You know, there was, um, there ended up being a couple of times when we had a, a major issue financially, you know, a lot of rework. There was no way we were going to get out of it. Um, I think there were some legal repercussions to it too. And so we had to go and say, okay, why is this happening? Um, other times since then, you know, it's been repetitive things. It's things that, that hurt morale or, you know, um, really look bad in front of your, your customer. And I, I thought, okay, I, I need to get my arms around this because this can't continue to happen. And so, um, you know, being able to explain that cost and really seeing the impacts of it, the repetitive nature or whatever, because I knew it was going to hurt our ability to do work with them. You know, we were losing people because um, they thought, geez, I, I really screwed that one up and and uh, I, I don't want to do that again. And so the, it's pretty easy to convince yourself if you look at that stuff and you really, you know, put it on paper, you know, tracking the cost of poor quality uh, is pretty simple, um, but you got to put it in dollars and cents so everybody understands it too. Uh, that's kind of the common language between operations and and uh, the quality uh, program. <clears throat> there are a lot of quality folks out there that will say stuff like, uh, "You can't put a cost on quality." Um, that cliche is something I don't really work uh, agree with because 
in the end, we're all, we all need to be profitable. The company does. And so if you think about this, if your company hasn't really been tracking it, it just works really hard. The workmanship is pretty good, but you're still having like three to 5% uh, rework per year. If you think about that, like, let's say it's a $50 million company and you get 3% of rework. Well, rework comes right off the bottom line. Um, that's, that's a lost profit right there. So 3% rework, one and a half million dollars a year. And, uh, you know, that you could have had on your bottom line, could have gone towards bonuses, new trucks, whatever it is. Um, if you just have a 10% improvement in one year, which is easily done, you could easily have, you know, 20 to 25% improvement in the first year. Um, that's $150,000. But if you're seeing a 25% improvement on that uh, in the first year, that's $375,000. That right there is easy enough to convince somebody. You know, there's a, there's a lot of other things too. Um, besides that, the morale, keeping people around the retention, the residual uh, benefits of that. Um, there, there's tons of benefits to it and then retaining your customer base. So if you can somehow quantify that, put it in dollars and cents or whatever you need to, number of incidents, um, it's pretty easy to convince somebody that a program like that is necessary. And if you don't believe it, just do that exercise yourself. You can go back and look at it and try to put a number on it, ballpark it, and you'll see that it really would be beneficial to have a, uh, a quality program. So I think you and I are speaking very much the same language as like the things that I've echoed and heard and the things that I've had a lot of positive experience with is that engagement with your staff, engagement in that it's more than just getting the technical aspects right. Yes, two plus two needs to equal four every time. And we shoot for that perfect, but we're never going to be perfect. Right. And it's just finding, I guess, that balance. But if you can support it with the culture like you're talking about, you're, you're going to be steps and leaps and bounds ahead of others. Yeah. And creating that reputation and creating that that desire, I don't know what the statistic is. I know I've seen it before, but it's like for every person you hire, like some percentage of their salary goes into the training that's like just lost overhead. And it might even be like an entire year's worth of salary that you lose in that process of hiring and training. And so for every person that you can maybe retain because of that culture, because of that success that you're having, it sounds very positive and very much like what everybody should really be investing in. I, I agree. Invest in your people. You can't go wrong. Even if you do lose a few people, you know, we have a, people probably hate to hear this, but we have a responsibility as engineers, as professionals to invest in people. You know, there's the, the old saying about uh, what if we invest in, in people and they, and they leave and, you know, well, what if we invest in them and they and they decide to, or don't invest in them? And they decide to stay. And it's kind of like it's true. I'd rather take that that gamble. And in the long run, if everybody is doing that, which they're not necessarily, but if, if they were all doing that, we would all have a better, um, you know, better industry out there. So we have a kind of a responsibility to just the industry as a whole, to everything to to invest in our people. They might just stick around a little bit longer. And not not have all this turnover. So, I I just feel like you can't go wrong if we if we invest in people. It's uh, you know it's it's the best way to go. I, I feel better about myself as a professional knowing that I invested in people. You know, looking out for their best interests. So I think we share a lot of good advice, a good idea, a good concept that that hopefully people will embrace. But we also like to include with every show. Uh, what we call the power of experience segment. Maybe it's just some piece of advice, some aspect of your career it can be completely unrelated to this um, and what we've talked about, but what advice would you like to leave the listeners with that you have found that has been a positive experience in your career? Um, I, I think at one point it was embarrassing to me, but uh, it's turned out to be really positive. Um. When I started out as a quality control manager on a design build project, um, you know, I didn't have anybody to mentor me really. Um, and I was just kind of looking at it as poor workmanship equaled poor quality. And so I would really kind of go after the individuals that I felt like were performing uh, poorly 
and were costing the company money. <clears throat> and I felt like the police and, and that was the wrong approach to take. I learned that pretty quickly. Um, I found that if you really look into it, you do your root cause analysis and continuous improvement measures, you end up finding that it's really something environmental or they don't have the right tools and equipment or it's uh, someone's driving schedule or whatever. And you end up finding there's a real root cause to that and something that could be uh, fixed. And so, you know, I that's what it really got me to gear my um, my whole outlook on quality as invest in your people, give them the autonomy to be able to do their job, you know, the tools, the equipment, the working environment, and then, you know, help them master that and then help them understand they're part of something bigger. You know, the company is dependent. People are dependent on them to do a good job. And then I've been able to apply that to the rest of my life. And, you know, really investing in people is, is the right way to go. Uh, I, it hasn't failed me yet. I think it, I, they say that about networking and networking with, with people is like, you're trying to help other people just by being a good person, a good friend, a, a contact, maybe giving a referral with no intention of getting anything back. And the people that are most successful seem to get it back without even asking for it because they create that circle of people that are willing to do the same for them. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Yeah, never give anything with the expectation that you're going to get something in return for it. Right, like, I mean, in that example that you gave, that if, if the people that you were trying to improve the quality of their work, but if they didn't have the right tools or they didn't have the right training and you don't change anything about that expectation and you don't do anything to help them, then they're not going to get better. I've talked on that with where, I've worked with people that have been very smart, very intelligent people, and they just didn't work out. And then you find out about them three, four, five, six months later, and they're getting promoted and they're doing the same thing, but with a different company. And it's like, why did it not work here or there? And it, it always came back to the leadership and the investment that the people were getting from their leadership. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that you're echoing a lot of things that I've heard and a lot of things that more people need to embrace. Do you have any final advice for engineers or engineering leaders that they can create a strong company with a culture of quality? Nothing off the top of my head, um, but be creative. Um, you know, every situation is going to be different. Um, really look into you know, ways of, of strategizing to improve your quality and get everybody at, at every different level involved. If you, if you have some key initiatives or some low hanging fruit, get the individuals who are actually doing the work involved, get, you know, listen to what they have to say. Um, they're going to be more invested in the whole process. They're going to be happy to, to work with you. They're going to embrace the quality program you know, just, just get them involved at every level and then cheer them on, you know, let them know that they did some amazing things. Never use somebody, you know, use their names when they, when they do a great job, but never make somebody the subject of uh, this guy's, you know, mess something up, you know, just make sure that they, they understand that mistakes can be made, you know, not just to, not give them a hall pass, but uh, let them know and, and help them understand how they can improve. And if you take that approach with it, you're going to have a lot more people invested a lot earlier into the program and your culture is just going to be a lot better for it. I think that's a ton of great advice. Hopefully people are thinking about things a little bit differently right now. What is the best way to get in touch with you or connect with you if they did want to learn more about what you're doing and uh, your resources? I don't have any big website that, you know, you can just email me at uh, my work email. It's B-E-M-A-R-T-Z at Terracon. That's T-E-R-R-A-C-O-N.com. Um, or you can just connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, have a discussion there. Uh, be happy to kind of look at what you're doing and, um, you know, just have a chat with you. Um, yeah, I'd enjoy that. So, well, thank you for your time. I do want to be courteous of it. We're all busy professionals, so 
Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Have a good one. Please remember that you can find the show notes for this episode and all episodes at engineeringqualitycontrol.com. You'll find a summary of the key points that we discussed today, as well as links and resources, including how to get in touch with Brian. Until next time, friends, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.